So to, to get to the heart of the matter, you know, why is if, if that is what private cloud is, what why is private cloud either good or or, or not such a good idea? Uh, Carl, your 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 sense, what, or if if you if are you a fan or not such a fan of private cloud? So I think I want to come out between most of the folks on this equation, but I, private cloud is not inherently bad. But what I would actually say is that if I'm looking to get into cloud and start providing these services for our customers, I would always start with public because you, if, you're, if you look at what, what is the business problem you're trying to solve, you're either trying to reduce cost or you're trying to make things more efficient for your developers or IT staff or be more agile, all of the time reductions can be handled by you know, one, analyzing the processes, solving for the bottlenecks, but you can do all those things in public or private. Public has the added benefit of not taking you six months and a bunch of time to get stood up. You can start using it immediately. Start learning about what your workloads are, start learning about what your consumption model is, and then once you have a significant spin and understand, then you can actually do a reasonable business case about whether or not you should be building and bringing it in-house. But I think the barrier for that is probably higher than most people think it is. Oh, you're actually portraying the public cloud almost as a gateway to the private cloud. Am I, I think it, right? I think it, I think it's the responsible thing to do because you just don't know enough to build a business plan uh, about what your real needs are early on. You should start experiment and learn in the public and then decide. Would be my opinion. I, I'm going to go on record and say that Amazon is a demand generation engine for private cloud. <laughs> What do you mean by that, Scott? Because obviously it, Amazon is always very you know, down on the idea of private cloud, except for the one they built for the CIA. Otherwise, they don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, what I mean by that is, you know, you hear what Carl is saying. There are just a tremendous amount of customers that start in public cloud, whether that's their official strategy or whether that was just a team that swiped their credit card and, and went that way and started using it. Shadow IT, almost. Yeah, and... and Either way, I think it's, it, it is often the right approach. You can experiment, you can move fast, you can decide if things work, and at some point, you either get caught and you're violating your company's policies and they say, hey, you, gotta, you can't do this outside, or you start spending way more money than you need or you're not getting the efficiency you need or the latency to your users or whatever the hundred reasons are people use private cloud, and then they start calling the private cloud providers and say, hey, you know, let's have a conversation. So I joke that Amazon is, is a great pre-sales and demand generation engine for, for mm. our business. I wonder but, if that's... Uh, sorry. Please, go, uh, Matt, Matt, go ahead. Are you, are you, are you for or against private cloud? Well, I, I think I'm pretty firmly on the record as against. <laughs> uh, I want to officially ask you the question. Maybe yeah. you've changed your mind in the last two hours. <laughs> no. But, no. But, but part of it is that... Um, so I hear what Scott and, and Carl are saying, and I think... I mean, I don't know if that's still the case. It certainly has been the case that a lot of the, a lot of the capacity on AWS, for example, was taken up with um, test and dev, people kicking the tires, frustrated with IT, so they go out, they spin it up on AWS, and then for all the reasons that Scott said, they, they get caught, or, or, or maybe they just find out, hey, you know what, this isn't, this isn't what we ultimately wanted. We want more control, we want our data in-house, whatever. Um, they come back. I think that's becoming less and less the case over time. Certainly if you ask Amazon, they'll say, no, it's not test and dev anymore. They'll tell you that they're running serious production. And I think, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. But I, I do feel like once you've tasted public cloud and that, and that freedom, and when you, James, reference shadow IT, the main reason for shadow IT is that for all of IT's good intentions about delivering the convenience of a public cloud, long before it was called public cloud, or you know, long before we had this debate, I people just wanted to get stuff done, and and IT not because they're incompetent, not because they're bad people, but just for a variety of reasons couldn't deliver that convenience, and so they people started going around them, call it shadow IT, and I think that's just going to continue, and I think it's going to become more pronounced. Now, will we live in a world that will it become increasingly hybrid? I think so because IT is going to find ways to get out in front of this of this demand. But I think unless IT looks like that first taste of public cloud, 
then they don't stand a chance because no one wants to go back to IT in the in the bad old days. Couldn't couldn't agree more. That, like, if if my option is Amazon or a traditional IT run private cloud, private cloud isn't an option at, at that point, right? Right. But if you can have a private cloud that gives you the developer experience of a public cloud, which you know product pitch uh, alert, like that's what we do. Um, then at, at, at MetaCloud, you mean? At MetaCloud, now Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud. Um, okay. <laughs> I like that term. Uh, yeah. thank, you, thank you, brand. Uh, so, but if that's what you sell, then to me, and I'm a, I'm a cloud purist, um, you know, slapping a cool dashboard on traditional virtualization um, and having run books and... Uh, approvals to get access to things and traditional IT security policies and scar tissue. That's not a cloud to me. Sorry. Like, I don't care what technology you're using. It's not a cloud. Right? You're absolutely right, Scott. And I think that the distinction between private and public cloud is going to get diluted really quickly here over the next two years, especially when we look at platforms as a service, containers, and other technologies that abstract that infrastructure to the level of the concern from the CIO and the CTO is about that control of data, right? And so they can keep that data on-prem and, and or with a, a cloud service provider, then they've taken care of that control of data challenge that they're trying to solve. And I, I agree with Greg on that wholeheartedly. I mean, I think that the ultimate problem you're trying to solve is friction between the lines of business and IT. And I certainly think I'm very bullish on Kubernetes and containers and these more platform as a service type solutions that abstract the IT operations concerns from the developer's code. I think there's a lot of promise there to, to actually deliver on a hybrid vision, which to date I don't think I don't think hybrid really exists right now. I think it's really multi-cloud. Uh, yeah, but to, hybrid is an outcome, right? To, right. It's kind of like DevOps. Like DevOps isn't a thing you buy. Hybrid cloud is not a thing you buy That's either, right. right? And and I guess this is a question for Matt. Sorry. What, to do, you, what do you mean, just to be here. sure? Like when you say it's not a thing you buy, I mean, it, please, please explain that, Scott. So hi hybrid cloud, and we have plenty of customers. I'll, I'll use Tapjoy as an example. Big mobile ad network. They're going to do like a trillion transactions a year. They use Amazon for all of their front-end ad serving and all of their you know, spiky traffic. They moved all of their Hadoop, all their analytics and big data for what gets delivered through their platform back onto MetaCloud, now Cisco. Same experience to their developers. It's just a target, right? They, they just want an easy, fast, predictable cloud enabled target, right? And so we give them that privately, give them the efficiency for their static workloads. They use Amazon. That's hybrid. They buy it from two people, but they've cobbled together with a whole bunch of automation and, and tooling and a hybrid outcome for them, right? So, Scott, actually, can you can you give a little bit more detail on, on the Tapjoy example? Because Etsy told me the same thing, that they actually went, went the opposite direction, similar to it sounds like what Tapjoy did in the and they found all these efficiencies from bringing some things back in-house, mm -hmm. like their Hadoop clusters are run in-house. They used to run on Amazon. They don't anymore. Um, and I kind of felt like, well, yeah, because you're Etsy. You've got a bunch of Uber engineers that can, can do this sort of thing. And maybe that same is true of Tapjoy. But what, what, exa what, what, exa what kinds of workloads are they running internal or on their quote-unquote private cloud on their own infrastructure um, versus public. So Wes Josie, uh, their head of ops, has, has actually been on stage quite a few times talking about it. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to tweet out the, the links to those things. But essentially, they brought back, they started with just their, their big data. And they looked and said, OK, you know, these are tons of VMs running at capacity all the time in a public cloud, even with reserved pricing. We're still going to be able to fine tune the hardware they run on and the configs and other things to such an extent. They're on record saying they saw 5x efficiency gains. So for every dollar they were paying Amazon to run their Hadoop, they got five times the capacity out of their private cloud. But so, part of that was the fact they were at scale, right? I mean, they could not have done that yeah, in a smaller scale. They're not scale. running, right, you know, the, the efficiency uh, curve here, if you have five VMs, it doesn't make sense to go buy yourselves racks of hardware, right? Um, but you know, when you're in the thousands of virtual machines type type of, of range or thousands of cores uh, worth of capacity, it, it really starts to make sense to look at you know what are my known static workloads that are going to be here for quite a while. And I actually think that's key is actually understanding what is known, understanding what the 
so that you could model a private cloud to fit that. You know, if you know that you're going to be doubling in size over the next year and a half, it's really going to hurt the efficiencies of going and buying stacks and stacks of hardware. Um, but whereas if you know that you're Hadoop, we know what this workload looks like, we can design and optimize for it, it makes it a lot easier. And, and grow that environment over time or, you know, use excess capacity um, if your Hadoop cluster's not running at scale to, to run other things. And, you know, so they, they've continued to grow their, their environments and, you know, looking at adding additional availability zones. They've been a great um, participant, I think, in that conversation publicly uh, and, and have a lot of good data come out. So that's that's similar. Sorry, James. No, that's, no, you go. Um, so that's Jim Whitehurst, Red Hat CEO. Jim Whitehurst told me, um, "Yeah, Matt, public cloud becomes obscenely expensive at scale." Kind of to the point I think you were making, Scott. Um, on those, particularly on the, he said it's great for for those uh, workloads that are variable that you you can't predict bad for those static workloads where you know what it's going to look like for a long time. I kind of question how, I mean, how static are these workloads? For I know within Adobe, for example, um, you know, we don't know what our business is going to look like five years from now. I mean, really, we don't. We could say we're going to still be shipping Creative Cloud and whatnot, and, and, and hopefully we will, but the reality, of, I think, of business today is that you've got to be really, really flexible, really agile. And I remember talking with Matt Wood at Amazon. He's their data science guy. He's like, why would you hardwire a certain hardware infrastructure when you're, the kind of, kinds of questions you want to be asking of your data are going to constantly change? And so you need that elastic, flexible infrastructure. And that, that really resonated with, with me. So again, how... How static, if, if private cloud is particularly good, and I didn't hear you say only good, but particularly good for those static workloads, how, how much can you really rely on those workloads remaining static for, for a year, two years? Well, Matt, to, to that point, Adobe is building an OpenStack cloud in Oregon right now. I mean, so, I mean internally, I mean, obviously there's, there's a use case there for a private cloud. That must kill you, Matt. Not when I find out about this. <laughs> I was going to say, is, is this news to you, Matt? I'm closing I'm, this. I'm even wearing my shirt today. Just I'm not, I'm not. And Greg, you've got yours on, too. Five yeah. years. This, Greg, is an ama- I, this is amazing. Greg, i got to make a call here. You guys, shut it down. Shut <laughs> it down. Greg, I hope we you get a report on that. <laughs> well, Matt, that's the end of your anti-private cloud uh, articles. That's it. It's been nice while it lasted. <laughs> Look to, to your to your question, which is which I think is really a, a very valid question. Um, it's not like they went out and purchased a, a, a super fine tuned fit for purpose. This is only going to run this version of Hadoop ever type of right. hardware environment or something else, right? Like in their case, this was pre Cisco, so you know they went out and they they bought some white boxes and you know they essentially built themselves a cloud, but that was optimized for their business um, and you know the, the types of, of configuration control that they wanted to have on the environment and the types of general VM workloads that they knew they would have for some period of time. Um, they're more than halfway through their amortization period um, on, on that environment, right? Like they've been in production for quite a while, they continue to grow. So, and in the meantime, it's a it's an infrastructure as a service platform. So they, they continue to move more and more microservices and other pieces of what they do to that environment as they as they grow it. And they continue to grow at Amazon at the same time. And we see that over and over with our with our customer base is that they are not just using private cloud. And I think that's the right way to think about it. You know, it, it is about just having the right targets of workload wherever they might live for your for your business and being flexible. Hey, Let's James, can we do a check-in right here? Can we just please. all agree that private cloud is not dead? I mean, oh, I think that's yeah. clear. The, the statistics alone say it's not dead. Yeah. All right, I just want to make that very clear. Oh, yeah. that, that, well, James, they don't, they don't quite say that. What they say oh, is, is that... Oh, is that true? Okay. Well, just if you take the... Who was it? What's his name? At, Gardner. Say, the, what's his name? Uh, um, Matthew Bittman or Michael Bittman? Uh, I think Thomas. Thomas, Thomas Bittman. Thomas, Thomas Bittman. Bittman. Yeah, of the course. Public, yes. public 
public cloud VMs are growing at like 20x and private at I think 3x. So that's not dead by any stretch, but it's well, not. Well, he says that, Matt, but you, and, I, and I've, 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 I've tried to call this out before. He doesn't link to any research that supports that what he posted in the blog. I'm not calling him a liar. I'd like to understand what's behind those numbers, though. Right, and I don't know. I'm just I'm going off of his his data, but you're right. Like he doesn't point to one of his research reports for it. But so again, I mean, back to back to the comment um, I think that Carl made. Most people, if they're doing it right, should be starting in public cloud, right? And so, okay, they're growing at 20x. Maybe the 3x. Maybe those numbers are right. I'm I'm not a data scientist. I don't claim to know, but maybe those 20x and 3x numbers are actually correct. And what we're seeing on the 3x is the trailing people that have started on public cloud, like a Tapjoy, and are now looking at how their how their private cloud um, can augment or replace pieces of what they started doing in public cloud. And we see that over and over. My phone does not stop ringing on that exact use case. Scott, I'll challenge and you a little bit because I I, th I think that when we talk, it, it depends what type of company you're talking about. I think when we talk about the Fortune 100, maybe even the Fortune 500. They'll be experimenting and doing some test dev, but the, the largest private clouds that I've seen have been inherently um, internally built, right? It, it, and I, I don't, I, I, by sheer numbers, you're probably right that that uh, AWS is probably the biggest lead generator for, uh, for, for a private cloud. But I think for those Fortune 100s, they're not starting off. In the in the public cloud, right? They're starting not off as a with strategy. infrastructure. Not as a not as a, a top down strategy. There are definitely teams at every Fortune whatever type company that are using Amazon or Google oh. or Azure or something else. That's your shadow know. IT, right? Yeah, absolutely. But so, could, yeah, can I go back to one uh, one interesting point I think Scott made that I think might be useful for the audience? So when you describe the that use case with you know Tapjoy, they're using multiple clouds. But I mean, I think the can we agree that the marketing spin of hybrid cloud of like application portability, like you, they're not moving around apps to each cloud willy nilly. They're choosing a home for an app, and then running each each app or workload in the right place for it for their business objectives. There's not this like mass migration of throwing things across different clouds all the time. They're saying, okay, the web front end makes sense for it to be here. It's going to be here. It, the data back end makes sense for it to be here. We're going to put it here. Do you yes, think that that's true? It, it's true to, to an extent just from a, a realistic how this thing gets run on a day-to-day -day basis. But in their case, they're fully automated in terms of how they deploy and test and abstracted away from everything. So to them, it doesn't matter that it's Amazon over here and OpenStack over here. Like, they're... None of that matters to them. It's just a target. If they wanted to move their entire operation back to Amazon tomorrow, they would just redeploy. Yeah, right. I guess the, the point I'm making is there's been a lot of marketing over the years I think is just kind of cruft, fluff crap that basically says, hey, we're, you know, we're going to move applications willy-nilly all around the world, which I haven't met a team or company yet that really had that much interest in doing that. That, 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 is, a very, that is a very hard problem to solve, and there are, there are companies uh, like, like this one back here that are, that are working on that problem, um, but it's not one... It, it's a very hard problem that a small percentage of companies at this point are really, truly trying to solve. 